Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Ryan, and I'm a guide for the Central Park Conservancy. Welcome to Central Park. Central Park Conservancy is a nonprofit organization that takes care of Central Park year round. Our mission is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from urban life, enhancing the enjoyment and well being of all. Because getting to Central Park isn't so easy for everybody, we want to continue to make it easier by bringing the park to you through our weekly walks, these virtual 12.30 p.m. lunchtime strolls that happen every Wednesday at 12.30. We're going to be exploring today Bethesda Terrace, which is sometimes referred to as the heart of Central Park, and we'll see why in just a little bit. We're going to be together for about 15 to 20 minutes on our walk today, and just about all of the photos you're going to see were taken by myself within the past week or so. Uh, we are going to see a few other photos that I use that I accessed using the Central Park Conservancy's archives, the New York Public Library Digital Archives, the Museum of the City of New York Archives, and the New York Parks Department Archives, which are public domains that you can access right at home. Real quick before we begin, I do just want to shout out a couple upcoming programs that we have happening. If you want to learn more about Central Park, join us on Tuesday, December 1st, 3 p.m. for Treasures of the Library. It's one of our virtual tour series. And with this one, we're going to be joined by our historian, Marie Warsh, here at the Central Park Conservancy, as well as New York Historical Society Librarian, Crystal Toscano. And they're going to be going over some really cool um, nitty gritty documents from the park, talking a lot about how the park came to be. So if you're into history, that's a great one to check out. If you do want to learn more about these weekly walks, we do of course have them every Wednesday, next Wednesday at 1230. I'm going to be leading us through the Children's District of Central Park, and you can always see the past weekly walks on our YouTube channel. Um, if you do want to learn a little bit about the trees of Central Park, on Thursday, December 3rd at 3 p.m., we have a virtual Trees of Central Park tour. And then Thursday, December 3rd at 5.15, we're going to be doing the holiday lighting up here at the Harlem Beer, where we put those Christmas trees on the Harlem Beer and have a nice little tree lighting. Not as big as Rockefeller, but still really special for us here at the park. If you check the chat box, you can see all of those upcoming programs that my colleagues just posted. But without any further ado, let's do a little bit of housekeeping and get right into our walk today. So as most of you know, who have joined us before, we're going to be using Zoom. And with Zoom, you can communicate with us. If you want to say hello, use the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from, or maybe a favorite memory you have of Bethesda Terrace. If you have a question, use the Q&A feature, and my colleagues, Jose and Ian, are going to be on the back end answering any questions you might have. So Bethesda Terrace is an area of the park that is, of course, very popular and visited by a lot of different people. So I would be very surprised if people haven't visited this area of the park before. Bethesda Terrace is located right at about 72nd Street, and we're actually going to start our walk just on 72nd Street. We're going to start at West 72nd Street and 8th Avenue, otherwise known as Gate, right in front of the Dakota. Slowly but surely, looks like that net connection. We do have any errors, just hold tight. I'll reconnect and we'll jump right back into it. But now that poll finally launched, have you ever visited Bethesda Terrace? Which I imagine to be probably an overwhelming yes. We're gonna really quickly get over to the terrace because there's a lot to cover in our walk today. So we're beginning on 72nd Street. We're gonna actually walk through Strawberry Fields right near Women's Gate. We're not gonna stop at Strawberry Fields because we actually do have a past weekly walk that talks a bit about Strawberry Fields. So if you would like to learn about Strawberry Fields, you can hop on our YouTube channel and see some of the past weekly walks. But as we walk by, we can admire that beautiful black and gray mosaic, that, or sorry, gray and white rather mosaic that's gonna be over here dedicated to John Lennon, adorned with some flowers. But we're gonna keep walking because we're gonna go see some other beautiful architecture at the Theft Street right as we get over to this crosswalk. And as we walk by a pretty happy little um, friendly site, we see one of the 72nd Street kiosks open. We're going to start to see actually visitor centers and these kiosks reopening in Central Park. And my colleague Kat is inside, one of our visitor service representatives, and she's in the park helping to give people questions for things to see and do. So it's really fun to see some friendly faces come open for some of the visitor centers that are opening in limited capacities and providing free maps. As we continue walking along, we'll see a little bit of color before we come to Bethesda Terrace. We're going to see some of these beautiful little wild roses that can be seen all over the park. And we might actually see some of these featured in the stone carvings of Bethesda Terrace. As we continue up the path a little bit more, we're going to come up to a tree on our left, which I can't help but really show a picture of. This tree on our left has an amazing burl that's growing on it. 
These burls are just kind of sudden growth on a tree that can come from an intrusion or really a number of different things occurring to the tree. It's really just a random growth. It doesn't mean the tree is sick or unhealthy, but it just creates these really interesting patterns like this one, which kind of reminds me of a target. I heard somebody on one of our past tree walks refer to this tree as target tree, which is a great name. We'll say goodbye to this cool target tree. And as we walk up, we're coming right up to Bethesda Terrace. Now I see it. most people voted in our poll. Thanks to everybody who's uh, sticking through the internet trouble. We have about 270 people with us today. And it looks like, no surprise there, a majority of people have visited Bethesda Terrace. It's the heart of the park, so that's no surprise. And we'll see a lot of the beauty as we start to walk around. So for those couple people that are not sure if you've been here before, maybe you have and maybe you'll recognize it. And those that haven't been here before, we're happy to show you it for the first time. So just a quick little oversight of Bethesda Terrace. If we take a quick little aerial view and zoom out, we can see a little bit of what the terrace looks like. A little confusing, but where we were just standing is right over here on this right-hand side near those umbrellas. What we're gonna do actually is we're gonna explore Bethesda Terrace starting with this back or south side over here where my cursor is. And then we're gonna come around down the staircase, explore the main area of the terrace before we check out what's in this little shady portion underground. And then we'll end with a nice little view from this balcony overlooking the terrace. So flashing back to the south side of the terrace, just on the end, we can come up to the very bottom or kind of start of the Festa Terrace at the end of the mall. And as we come up to this area, we can start to see some of the beautiful sandstone carvings. These uh, beautiful pillars are carved from New Brunswick sandstone. And they actually hold a theme that overtakes the entirety of Bethesda Terrace, a theme that's a little hidden. But when we look at the three carvings on each side, we can start to get the picture painted for us. On the far right, we're gonna see a carving of a rising sun. Right here in the middle, we're gonna see a rooster, probably crowing as that sun or calling as that sun's um, rising. And then over on the left, we're gonna see a farm scene. This is gonna represent a daytime theme. If we move over to the pillar just to the west or on the left side of this, we are going to see three other carvings, an open book, presumably a Bible read by candlelight. We're going to see in the middle an owl and a bat. And then on the far left, the most whimsical carving, a witch. What this is going to be representing is nighttime. And what we actually see the entirety of the terrace representing is the passage of time, which we'll start to explore in some of the other carvings. Another thing that we can see relating to the passage of the time, a passage of time is how this sandstone is really holding up. Sandstone is a great stone for carving, but eventually it does erode and wear down. And unfortunately, back in the 1980s, Central Park wasn't really cared for. The 60s and 70s saw a lot of damage, a lot of graffiti and vandalism. And unfortunately, some of the carvings in this area look like this. That owl was completely gone. It had ripped out and unfortunately didn't need to be replaced. Luckily, we do have a lot of wonderful skills, craftspeople working for New York City, the Parks Department and the Conservancy. And back in the um, 90s, we were able to re-sculpt this owl with one of the New York City Parks Department um, uh, sculptors, able to replicate this using old photographs and even just basically old plaster molds to get an almost mirror image of what this owl looked like. That luckily had been reattached and really kind of revitalized this area. So we will see a few carvings that have been replaced over time, but luckily we still do see plenty of original carvings mixed in with some of the replacements. And luckily the replacements have been replaced with authentic New Brunswick sandstone, the same sandstone from the same quarry in which this original sandstone came from when it was created between 1860 and 1865. Really cool piece of history. And as we walk across the street, even though it's a little cloudy and cold out today, we're getting warmed up by the culture of New York, like the saxophone player, lightening the mood and making a really enjoyable area. Really rarely we'll come to Bethesda Terrace and not see performers. As we continue walking down, we can now look at the continuing of this passage of time theme as it depicts seasons. On each of these staircases, we do see a different season depicted on each railing way. If we look on the far east side or the right hand side of the terrace, we can see one carving that is going to start bringing up a, a summertime theme. As we do start to walk down though, before that, we're gonna notice a lot of these beautiful side panels, which are made of marble, as well as one of my favorite details, which are the beautiful urns that add even more color to this overcast day. 
But as we start to walk down the staircase on the east side, we can see the springtime setting. And this springtime setting just features immaculate detail. Looking closer, we can actually identify some specific types of species of plants. Looks like English, uh, English ivy over here. Some of these look like some asters, plants that are blooming during all times, but especially in the spring. We come back a little bit, we can look just behind us and see the summertime setting. Looking at summer a little closer, we can see some of these larger roses, some of these wild roses like the ones we saw before in our walk over here. Different kind of plants that will be blooming during these times, but also just a great attention to detail. As we jump to the west side staircase, we'll see this continue into fall. Even though it feels really cold out in some areas, especially around New York, it is still fall. So we can look at the fall scene, see some of my favorite carvings, like this one on the left of a kingfisher catching a fish. And then on the right, just some great detail with these leaves and little fruit. It looks like quince maybe. And you can imagine some of these do have a little bit of damage. Um, we do need to replace a bit of these. Some of them do require replacement, but you'll notice that this area is a lot different than what it used to look like. Beyond just small little um, breaks like this, we used to see severe infrastructure damage. Large stone pillars like this were ripped off somehow. We see graffiti covering almost everything. This area was certainly a very, very different story back in the 70s. Not really a beautiful area you'd want to come and visit or take pictures of. We can see the winter side just over here on our left, which is covered with graffiti. Today, we luckily have a much cleaner park because of some of our different um, procedures like our graffiti uh, removal procedure. Graffiti is reported in the park. We do remove it within about 24 hours allowing the park to look much more beautiful and allowing the winter side to look very different, much cleaner. And as we look closer, we can see that graffiti is gone and we just see some of the beautiful details like this American holly over here, an evergreen plant that keeps its leaves during the winter time and has some beautiful little red berries. But amazing attention to detail in all of these carvings. As we do start to make our way down this staircase, we can step away a little bit from stone carvings and look at a beautiful, beautiful fountain and statue. That is going to be Bethesda Fountain. Bethesda, Bethesda Fountain, the centerpiece of Bethesda Terrace, is better known as the Angel of the Waters Fountain. The Angel of the Waters Fountain is actually the only desired statue here in Central Park. It was dedicated here in 1873 and was actually a requirement in the park's design. It was sculpted by a woman named Emma Stebbins, who was the first woman to receive a New York City Public Parks Commission. Very grand one at that. This Angel of the Waters actually pays tribute to the Croton Aqueduct, a series of pipelines that delivered clean drinking water to New York City, revitalizing the health of New York, drastically reducing waterborne illness that once existed. This angel is actually taking some inspiration as well from a biblical story. In the Gospel of St. John, there's a story where an angel comes down and disturbs Bethesda Pool in Jerusalem, giving that water healing properties. The new Croton Aqueduct system was seen to have healing properties as well as it reduced this waterborne illness existing in New York City. So this appropriately became a statue created to pay tribute. During this unveiling, the designer and sculptor Emma Stebbins quoted Bethesda Pool, which inspired this fountain. Uh, we do see people kind of really paying attention to that and started nicknaming this Bethesda Fountain, eventually leading to this being known as Bethesda Fountain and the terrace being known as Bethesda Terrace. Prior to this, it was just called The Terrace. It's a really interesting little story. This fountain gives this area its name. Just below that angel, we do see four cherubs representing temperance, purity, health, and peace. And typically water will cascade over them, but of course, as we approach winter, we do shut the pipes off to prevent freezing. But just behind the uh, beautiful Angel of the Waters Fountain, we can still see some water in the form of the lake, the largest naturalistic body of water here in Central Park, and certainly one of the more beautiful ones that help us connect to nature, even in a very formal setting saying hello to some Canada geese and some mallards who are stopping up to say hello. As we turn around, we see some beautiful views of the terrace. And these are some of my favorite looking back at the beautiful stonework. As we start to walk towards, we can walk by some of these great ornate detailings and we can walk up to another centerpiece of the terrace, which is the arcade. The arcade is certainly something we have to highlight. The arcade is arguably the most beautiful ceiling you will ever see. 
The ceiling of the Bethesda Arcade features Minton tiles, which are created in a collaboration between the Minton Tile Company from England and Jacob Ray Mole, the ornamentationist and designer for Central Park. These 49 panels feature two distinct designs and they make up about 15,576 individual tiles in case you wanna take the time to go around and count, checkmate. Um, but really, really beautiful immaculate work. These tiles, you can imagine like a lot of the park not always look so beautiful though. Unfortunately, this is what we do see them eventually looking like. There was a carriage road running just over this terrace area, the arcade area rather, and eventually we see the carriage road being used for vehicular traffic. We see a lot of things changing and wearing down over the years of the park, and eventually we see drainage becoming a big issue. Drainage from salt during the winter, rain, all the debris is leaking down and really ruining these tiles. These tiles were actually removed in 1983 once the Conservancy started taking over to prevent further damage. They were put into a storage facility for quite some time until the funds were raised to restore this area. During the time, this arcade looked like the picture on the right, very bare and decrepit. This project took quite a lot of effort, quite a lot of work, and was the most detailed project architecturally that the Conservancy has done to date. Um, it wasn't completed until 2007, so for over 20 years, these tiles sat in storage and the arcade looked like the picture on the right. It wasn't until after this major restoration project that these tiles were revitalized, over 14,000 of them being cleaned by hand. Amazingly, 75, over 75% 75 actually of the tiles were salvaged. Original tiles from the 1860s were kept um, and restored and put back up here. There were a few tiles that were made replicas and replaced, and they're actually made by the successor to the Minton Tile Company, Maw and Company. What I will let you know is that all of the tiles you see in this photo are original tiles. None of these are the replica tiles. So come out here and look at Bethesda Terrace, and especially in this main centerpiece, you can see a over 150 year old piece of history. This is actually the only area in the world where Minton tiles are used on the ceiling rather than for a floor as well. But a beautiful use of these encaustic tiles. And beautiful views can be seen all over the arcade. If, as if the tiles weren't beautiful enough, along the walls we can see frescoes, paintings done rapidly on a wet lime plaster to allow it to set in and really add just beautiful detail to these little archways. Looking around every corner can give us some beauty. Looking south facing up the steps, we can see that beautiful, beautiful southern facing mall area that adds a little bit of mystery and really encourages us to travel around and see where it leads. But arguably the most beautiful view we can see from Bethesda Arcade is going to be from right behind us. Turning around, we can see a beautiful view of that Angel of the Waters fountain perfectly framed in between the archway. A perfect and um, a perfect as well as a purposeful placement here in Central Park and in Bethesda Terrace, but absolutely beautiful. As we do start to walk out, I'm gonna launch another poll. I wanna see if anybody has maybe a favorite part of Bethesda Terrace. Maybe it's the fountain, the angel of waters. Maybe it's the carvings we've been seeing. Maybe the mint tiles we're standing underneath right now. Maybe the seasonal flower beds, which we're not really get, getting much of right now, but maybe you're a frequent to this area. Or maybe it's just the arcade in general, the beautiful arches and really the style of it. They're really reminiscent of El Hambra, an area in Granada in Spain that certainly inspired the arcade. As people vote in that, we'll continue just outside. We're going to start wrapping up our walk, but before we do, we have to pay tribute to a gentleman who really helped design this area. As we look at the immense details of this, we can remember Calvert Box and Frederick Law Olmsted, the designers of Central Park, who certainly gave it a lot of its natural character. Many of the beautiful designs and ornamentation, like this one, featuring, uh, featured on the spring pillar on the bottom of the east side staircase, or the works of a gentleman named Jacob Ray Mould, who I briefly mentioned before. Here's a picture of Jacob Ray Mould right next to this spring pillar. Jacob Ray Mould was the ornamentationalist and detailer for Central Park. He's the reason we have so many beautiful bridges and arches here in the park, and he is the reason we have these beautiful carvings at Bethesda Terrace. These carvings were all the design of him. However, there was a series of different craftspeople carving them between 1860 and 1865 but immense beautiful work that certainly still hold up to the test of time today. 
So Jacob Ray Mold is certainly very, very um, beneficial and very crucial in giving us the park we love and have today. And I'm gonna share those results from that last poll and not a big surprise there, the Angel of the Waters Fountain, which is just an immaculate piece, an eight foot tall angel and really just a very historic piece. Again, the first commission given to a woman in New York City, Emma Stebbins with that beautiful piece. And that would actually be her last work as well. We continue just up this staircase, we can come to a last little area to take a view. As we walk a little bit up to the railing, one of my favorite details are these beautifully carved little balance points on the railing that overlook the terrace. Before we do capture one last view though of present day terrace, I wanna take a quick look in the past. Looking back at Bethesda Terrace, we can see how far we've really come. Here's a picture a few decades ago. This is from about the 19, early 1980s, late 70s, and we can just see a very different, very, very different Central Park. We see car traffic, which was slowly banned a few years ago, only emergency vehicles now. We see a lot more trash than there is people, there maybe one or two people in this entire terrace area. We're going to see a very bare landscape. It looks like the arcade area is boarded up on the sides. Who knows if you can even get in there? Not that you really want to go to this area. That Angel of the Waters is very oxidized, looking like the uh, Statue of Liberty. Really, really decrepit area that certainly has bounced back tremendously. Today, even on a cold, frigid day, you can still see the terrace bouncing with culture and life. And it's very important today that we have people recognizing how important beautiful historical cultural hubs like this are. So I wanna thank you for joining us on our walk today. This will bring us to the end, but I do wanna launch one last poll. Uh, of course, we do have to kind of rush through some of these areas like Bethesda Terrace, which has so much information jammed into it. So I just wanna know, would you like us to revisit Bethesda Terrace? We covered a lot of the main areas or the main points of it today, but there's so many hidden secrets and things we can talk about. So I wanna see if anybody is interested in us visiting the terrace again. And if so, maybe what season you'd like us to visit it in. So we are going to wrap up and come to the end of our walk. And again, I want to thank everybody so much. We really love doing these and we love the continued support and um, uh, enjoyment of them. We really enjoy it. So thank you so much for joining us. As I mentioned earlier, we do have plenty of different walks and ways to stay involved coming up. We do have um, on Tuesday, December 1st at 3 p.m. that Treasures of the Library Walk with our historian and a librarian from New York Historical Society, if you want to talk about really detailed park history and see some really cool old documents, that's a great walk. December 2nd, you can see our continuing weekly walks. I'm going to be leading you through the Children's District next Wednesday. You can also see the past weekly walks on our YouTube channel. And then Thursday, December 3rd at 3 p.m., Trees of Central Park, for those who want to learn a little bit about the botany and trees. And then Thursday, December 3rd, we're also going to have that tree lighting at 515. You can join us virtually on Facebook Live. If you do check the chat sections, my, colleague are gonna be, my colleagues are going to be dropping the links to those right now. So you can copy down those links, sign up, and we'll see you next week. I am going to be leaving this open for a few minutes in case anybody does have any last minute questions. And real quick, I'll share those results. Looks like an almost overwhelming, almost 100% of people voted that they would love for us to revisit Bethesda Terrace. And it looks like the springtime is gonna be the most favored time to visit. So we're certainly gonna be keeping these walks going and we're really, really happy that everybody's enjoying them. We hope to see you next week. Again, I'll keep this open if anybody has any last minute questions you'd like, but from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, thank you so much, stay safe and be well. All right, everybody, take care.